my gratitude goes also to the World uh, Affairs Council for hosting this this talk, this meeting. Um, UNRWA, the organization that I presently lead, has very close ties with the United States, which we can talk about. Um, the United States is our largest bilateral contributor and uh, is a strong supporter. And with the United States, with Congress in particular, we have a rich debate, sometimes difficult debate, but certainly a fruitful one that um, has always resulted in a close and important partnership for us over the decades. We also have, of course, uh, important links with the civil society in different forms in the United States. And this meeting with you today is a manifestation of that. It's the first time that I certainly, as in my time uh, of, uh, with UNRWA, come to, to San Francisco or to the West Coast. I, I don't think my predecessor, who was American, uh, actually came here. So it's been quite a while, quite a long period of time since a head of the, this agency has been uh, in this part of the United States. So thank you for this opportunity. Um, a few words about UNRWA. We were just talking with Chuck a few minutes ago. Uh, this is uh, an organization of the UN that not only has one of its most impossible acronyms that nobody really understands, but also is uh, a fairly uh, uh, little known and sometimes even misunderstood uh, organization. Uh, that's because the question of Palestinian refugees, which we deal with, or the consequences of that question which we deal with, is also a not very well known issue, a long issue that dates back to the late 40s, uh, a controversial for, for, issue for many, and an issue that is so steeped into one of the most difficult conflicts of the world, that somehow dealing with it, just like dealing with other aspects of this conflict, intimidates and discourages. And that's why I think over the years, for a variety of factors, the work that we do and the, the causes for, of us being there, doing that work, have been marginalized, forgotten, or rather uh, the monopoly of a small group of experts, either very fierce critics or very passionate supporters, and then, of course, the refugees themselves and those like me that work for them. A bit of history. The, Palestinians, uh, the Palestinian refugees became refugees in 1948 when uh, Israel uh, uh, became an, a recognized independent state. So the refugees that we're talking about are Palestinians that come originally from what is now the state uh, of Israel. They were then 750,000, but with the passage of time, they have become uh, almost uh, five, uh, 5 million. UNRWA was um, uh, created the year after uh, the Arab-Israeli War in 1949 to deal with what at that time was deemed to be a short-term issue, uh, something that would go away quite quickly, and uh, uh, a relief operation was set up, uh, and that was carried out by UNRWA. Unfortunately, the failure of the parties, Israelis and Palestinians, and of the international community at large to find a solution to this question has meant that after more than 60 years, the organization is still, uh, is still there and still working in all the areas where those refugees went originally. So Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Gaza, which was then administered by Egypt, and the West Bank, which was then under the control of Jordan. This is still where we, we operate. Um, what we did initially, we were really a, a relief organization in the first few years. That was for then, for 1949, 1950, that was a major exodus. And uh, the problems were very acute. People were dying of hunger and of disease. So UNRWA was really like you see today with refugees from Syria, was really dealing with the immediate emergency. But as the situation beca became more stagnant, UNRWA became more of a provider of 
services to a population that no other state um, had absorbed in their own country as, uh, as fully-fledged citizens pending a political solution to their plight. And so we became a provider of education and health in particular and other social services. Now, today, we are a very large education operation in particular. Just to give you a sense of the size of what we do, in our schools we have half a million children every day. That's very large for, for an organization that is not a state, but is a United Nations agency. And we also have a large health program and uh, other activities. Uh, of course, what has happened over the decades is that the Palestinian refugees that are under our mandate uh, have found themselves not only living in a very uh, protracted exile, but also have found themselves entangled in conflicts belonging to other people. Think of Lebanon, where civil war raged for 15 years. There's many Palestinians there. Actually, they got more than entangled, even involved in some instances. In Jordan, the same. Even outside the area of UNRWA in Iraq or in the Gulf, the Palestinians very often have found themselves, because they are in this volatile region, uh, affected by other people's conflict. And therefore, UNRWA has had to add to its regular services uh, those type of emergency activities over and over again that were its characteristic at the beginning. So our relief, which is in our name, our relief dimension, our relief humanitarian component has never really gone away because in spite of the population stabilizing, uh, they, this continuous entanglement in conflict has meant that their humanitarian needs resurfaced all the time. Um, that brings me to an important point that I'd like to share with you today. What, um, uh, talking of this, talking of getting entangled in conflict, brings us to what is perhaps the most acute challenge that we are uh, faced with today. Work, doing our work in the Middle East, and that is Syria. There are in Syria, of those five million people that I mentioned to you, there are over half a million, 540,000 um, Palestinians registered with UNRWA as refugees in Syria. For a long time, Palestinians in Syria, whatever the situation of Syria, whatever the nature of the government there, for a long time, Palestinians in Syria enjoyed a relatively stable environment. In fact, at times, the most stable environment in the region. But after the war started two and a half years ago, and after an initial period in which the Palestinians managed to stay out of the conflict, the conflict itself reached them. The conflict became so widespread, especially in the urban areas where Palestinians live, that their own camps, their, the areas in which they live, uh, became very severely uh, affected. The Palestinians in Syria are an interesting uh, uh, aspect of this crisis. You know, I always say that it is important that, to remember that the Syria crisis which is perhaps today, no, not perhaps, surely today, the, the most acute emergency, political, um, uh, humanitarian, uh, uh, strategic emergency in the world, that emergency has a lot of different dimensions. The Palestinian dimension is one of many, uh, but is a very sensitive and important one to understand. It helps actually understand the conflict as a whole, but it is important to understand its specificity and how it can impact the, the future of the Palestinian refugee question as well. Like I said, Palestinians in Syria live in 12 locations. And uh, as we speak of these 12 locations, more than half, maybe seven or perhaps eight, uh, have become theaters of very fierce war. Um, usually the pattern, and it is a pattern that we have seen in other communities in Syria, not just with Palestinians, and you will have seen this in the media, the pattern is that opposition groups take hold of the center of these communities, villages, 
neighborhoods of uh, uh, urban centers. And uh, that this attracts, of course, the response of government security forces and forces fighting alongside with them that encircle these areas. And the civilians that don't manage to get out in time from those areas, including the Palestinians, get trapped. And get trapped in, in situations in which uh, reaching them with food, with medicines, with relief operations becomes impossible. It's actually quite uh, worrying what is happening. We. Uh, the, the most symbolic area, perhaps, is called Yarmouk. This is a very, you may have heard this name, this is a very large neighborhood of the capital city of Damascus, which used to host a very large Palestinian community, about 160,000. It has been virtually besieged for the past uh, 10 months, since the end of last year, and we've been able to reach uh, the, the heart of the, of the area only a few times and not for the past three to four months. Uh, we estimate that of the 160,000 Palestinians originally living there, maybe 20,000 are trapped inside. Uh, we are in touch sporadically with them, but what we hear is very disturbing. Famine, disease, rampant disease, and impossible to reach because the war in Syria uh, unlike what is often portrayed, is not a war with clear front line and clear lines of command, either on the government and on the opposition side. It's a very messy war where front lines change every day. That's very dangerous, as you can imagine, because you don't know where you are and with whom you have to deal with. And the lines of command are very, very arbitrary and volatile. So you may get permission to access an area, and the next day that permission may, uh, may not be there anymore, or you may be in an area where you're not uh, allowed to be. You know, we have already lost eight staff members killed in, in, in this operation, and of about 19, we don't know the whereabouts. There's a lot of kidnappings on both sides. There is a lot of trading of hostages. It is, you know, I've been, I've been involved in my career, as was mentioned earlier, in a lot of rather messy situations. But this is now up there or down there with the worst of the past 20 years, with Central Africa, with the Balkans. And it is astonishing that this has happened in a country that whatever its problems was, as I said, relatively stable for a very long period of time. Um, another feature that I want to mention about Syria before moving on to other parts of the region is that uh, the Palestinians, let me go back to the Palestinians, the Palestinians are like we always say, they don't have a monopoly on the suffering. Of course not in Syria. Every civilian there suffers from a very dire situation. But because of their history, um, they are particularly vulnerable. You know, what is quite interesting is that even after more than 60 years of being hosted quite well, quite in a quite stable manner by a country, of having access to jobs, to, to, um, to employment, to, uh, to services, uh, with UNRWA able to deliver its work without any problems. As soon as the situation became difficult, the vulnerability of this community emerged. Uh, it became much more difficult for them to compete for jobs because obviously in a situation of emergency, jobs go to nationals first, even if those are refugees from a long period of time. And I think that more than that, what is very clear is that the Palestinians, because of what they represent, they represent a conflict that has not been able to be resolved for very long. So moving out of Syria, just like many Syrians do, has been much more difficult for them. Jordan has closed its borders only to the Palestinians from Syria. And so they have been compelled to go out from the narrow uh, exile route of Lebanon and finding themselves in Lebanon, for those who managed to escape from Syria, Lebanon is a country where, as you may know, Palestinians have always lived a very precarious existence. This is probably of the countries in the region, the one where they have least access to employment, least access to services, no property rights. They live in very poor conditions, depending almost entirely on our organization. So now the fact that a group comes from Syria, in addition to those already in Lebanon, is a, a, a very big 
complication adding to their vulnerability. I always say also, and I remember that the only time where I had the honor of meeting your Secretary of State who consulted the humanitarian agencies on the situation in Syria, the one point I thought it was important to make to Secretary Kerry was that this exodus of Palestinian, second time exodus of Palestinians from Syria, is creating an additional complication, not only to the people themselves, of course, hardship to the people themselves, but is creating a complication to the solution of the Palestinian refugee question within the other political track, the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. You know that Israelis and Palestinians have recently resumed direct talks under strong, that's very good, strong mediation of the United States. And one of the issues that is on the table in that very difficult discussion is the question of refugees. What to do with refugees? You know, the Israeli position is that they cannot go back to Israel where they originally come from because that would alter the Jewish character of the state. The position of the refugees themselves, of the Palestinians, is that all of them have a right to return. You have these two very contradictory contrasting narratives that make this one of the most difficult issues in that peace negotiation to be resolved. Now, the, the, the fact that the refugees are now, in one area at least, scattered and, and, and the geography of their exile changes again, makes even that discussion and that negotiation more complicated. So it's not just a humanitarian crisis, but from, from the point of view of the, of the Palestinian dimension of it is also a political complexity that adds itself to the many complexities in the region. Um, I just want to, before I close, I wanted to mention a, a few other things. Uh, we've, I've concentrated on Palestinians in Syria because it is the crisis of the day, because it is important to remember that it has a Palestinian dimension, and because of the complexity that it adds to an already complex problem. But I think it is very important not to forget that half of the Palestinian refugees actually live in the occupied Palestinian territories. This is one of the... <laughs> strange aspect of this strange history. Because when they fled in 1948, as I said, they went to Gaza, which was then not occupied by Israel, and they went to the West Bank, which was then under Jordanian control. And when in 1967, I hope you can follow all this difficult chronology, in 1967, uh, the Six Day War uh, resulted in Israeli occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, an occupation that continues to this day in different shapes and form, the people who had fled there from Israel found themselves under the control of Israel from which they had fled. Some of them fled again at that time, mostly to Jordan, but most of them stayed. So UNRWA continued to work uh, now in coexistence with the Israeli authorities in the occupied Palestinian territory. That's actually a very important aspect, part of our work, which uh, in spite of differences on a number of issues, Israel actually supports because it recognizes that we fulfill an important function in providing education, health, and other services to this population. So um, um, what I brought this up because I think that it is important while we focus on Syria not to forget the very serious issues that Palestinians, including refugees, are going through in the territories. In Gaza, uh, you know, the, uh, Gaza is, has been in the limelight now twice in the past five years. In 2008, when the 20 day war raged, causing a lot of damage in Gaza, causing damage in southern Israel because of the rockets. Um, and then again in November last year, you may recall, there was another flare up, shorter, but uh, still quite uh, violent. Um, the root causes of those tensions have not been resolved. Uh, in Gaza, there is the additional complication that the Gaza Strip is under the control of Hamas, a movement that is 
um, not an interlocutor of any uh, Western nation and a movement that is at odds with the Palestinian leadership in the West Bank, in Ramallah. So there is a split in the Palestinian leadership which has weakened considerably that very leadership of the Palestinian people, but something that seems to have uh, defied any attempt at bringing reconciliation between the two factions. So that's an additional element of complication. I, I, I raise this because in Gaza, UNRWA, my organization, has probably its largest operation. Gaza is, 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 a, is, a, is a small sliver of land uh, of 40 kilometers long and two or three kilometers wide on the shores of the Mediterranean, detached, as you know, from the West Bank bordering mostly with Israel, but also with Egypt, and blockaded by Israel since, since 2007. The blockade has been uh, considerably uh, lightened, uh, relieved after 2010, something that we have been pushing, the UN has been pushing Israel to do, so that's positive. But it's a very fragile process because every time rockets are thrown from Gaza into southern Israel, or every time now in Egypt, which is the other bordering country, political developments make the relationship between Egypt and Gaza sensitive and difficult, the blockade is uh, uh, is reimposed in very severe way. You know, uh, we can speak about that later. I think the most serious aspect of the blockade, which by the way the United Nations considered Ill considers illegal from the point of view of international law, considers an illegal collective punishment on a whole population, while of course uh, uh, recognizing the security concerns of both Egypt and Israel. But what the blockade has really impacted is the economy. The, the, the Gaza is an exporter, believe it or not, or was an exporter of cheap goods into Israel and the West Bank, and uh, that is now uh, prohibited, and that has virtually destroyed uh, the economy in the Gaza Strip, has obliged most of the population to depend on humanitarian assistance or illegal trafficking through the tunnels with Egypt, and has caused a lot of problem. A few people may have actually been enriched by this, a few profiteers, but the bulk of the population is in very dire straits. What worries me about Gaza today is one that we have, from our point of view, the humanitarian point of view, very worrying indicators of a worsening of the situation. You know, we measure every year an indicator which we call the food security level. That's an important measurement of the economic well-being and, in general, of the welfare of the people. Uh, we've seen already last year uh, in food insecurity going from 44 to 57 percent of the families in Gaza. And we have reasons to believe that this year this has worsened again. So there is a problem there. And if you add this to the tensions that flare up regularly between Hamas and Israel, between Hamas and Egypt, you have there the recipe for not very good developments. Remember also that the other part of the Palestinian territory, the West Bank, is under direct occupation of Israel. And there you know the problems. I don't need to repeat them. Um, uh, ever expanding settlement, uh, Israeli settlements, that's another very serious point of contention with the State of Israel because the United Nations considers settlements as illegal according to international law. Um, and in general, uh, life made very difficult for Palestinians, including Palestinian refugees in the, that part of uh, the occupied territory, including in particular East Jerusalem, where I have lived for the past few years. And we can talk about that. To conclude, this is a, 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 a landscape in great evolution. Um, you have uh, in the periphery of seen from Jerusalem, seen from where I, where I sit, you have a world in great turmoil. The Arab Spring has become a collection of very complex transitions in many Arab countries like Egypt, Syria, Libya, Tunisia, Yemen, and so forth. Some of which, especially Egypt, have great influence on the situation of the Palestinians. And uh, there is a lot of uncertainty surrounding the future of that, of those transitions. And 
you have uh, at the heart of this the resumption of a peace process or peace talks, uh, which is surrounded by a lot of skepticism, suspicions, doubts, tensions, but which frankly is a very important last opportunity to address what remains the fundamental political problem in the region. So in spite of the challenges that we all know that surround that process of talks, it is important to continue to invest politically, just like this country has been doing, but also other countries as well. What we have been, from our perspective, what we have been trying to remind the negotiators and the mediators of this very important process is that don't forget that amidst the many challenging issues that you have to address, you have that of Palestinian refugees, marginalized by history, but coming back into history every time there is a crisis. And don't forget that without a solution that takes into account their opinions, their wishes, their, may I say, realistic wishes, there will be not a complete solution to the conflict, and there will be no peace in the Middle East. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Grandi. And now we move on to the questions, and there are many questions. I think that some of the questions start back <coughs> with the question of history. There are a lot of uh, younger people who are here who were not around 60 years ago. And so let's start, <laughs> let us start with the question of why. Why did the 750,000 Palestinians flee from uh, then Palestine in uh, 1948? Was it panic, fear, encouragement, urging of the surrounding Arab nations? Uh, and then why were they not integrated uh, better into the surrounding nations? Do you want me to respond? I would together? appreciate, yes, please. Yes. Um, I'll stay here for the questions. Um, the uh, the Arab-Israeli War of 1948 and 49 uh, is it's it's quite interesting to read books about this war, uh, written by Israelis, written by Palestinians, written by people on either side that are in disagreement with their own countrymen, uh, because uh, it is per, you know all all history and all history of conflicts that have not yet been resolved has different narratives, of course. You know, we've seen this in the Balkans, we've seen it in so many other places. But this one is perhaps the one in which the narratives are most contrasting, because the narratives of what happened and uh, what happened afterwards are really steeped into existential issues. You know, the status of Jerusalem the situation of refugees, these go right into the heart of existential problems or issues for the Jews and the Arabs. And that's why they, ha they are so complex and difficult on both sides to address. That's why it has so been so difficult for the leaders of the Palestinians and the Israelis to convince their public opinions to make the inevitable compromises that will be required to make peace because people feel that they are really part of the, not only of their history but of their life and of their future. Uh, in 1948, the Palestinians that fled, as I said, about 750,000 fled because of a mixture of factors. Many were chased out by the militias that were fighting for the independence of the State of Israel. And there, there were very uh, grave episodes of this cleansing, which have been narrated in many books. Many fled because, they're, because they were afraid of the war that was around them, but thought that it would be short-lived and they would come back. And many fled because their leaders told them that it was you know, time to go away because otherwise they will be killed. So, and you know, this is not unique to the Palestinians. I've worked with refugees for 30 years. I've seen this in so many countries or in so many situations, this mix of, 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 of factors that are all based, however, in one fundamental sentiment, which is fear of, of the war around them. So that was why they fled. Um, why there are still refugees? 
because the conflict hasn't been resolved and the refugee dimension is a dimension of the conflict. Um, there are many reasons for that. Um, the, uh, the most important step towards peace over the past 65 years was probably the one taken in 1993, the Oslo Accords. That was the point where uh, we got closest to an agreement or to the beginning of an agreement. Unfortunately, it did not evolve positively. The accord outlined the process, that's what has been called the peace process, outlined the process to reach peace, which divided it up in what were called final status issues, the status of Jerusalem, resources, the borders, um, security of both Israelis and Palestinians, and refugees. Now, I, you know, I think that besides any other legal or moral consideration. One has to be realistic in, a, in analyzing a conflict as complex as this one. It is very obvious that there will be no solution to any of these components without a solution to all of them. That's very clear. So many say, OK, but why don't we solve the refugee question? They can stay where they are. We give them a compensation. Well, not only that would offend, of course, the sense of justice of the refugees themselves that demand justice, but also it would be politically impossible because you cannot solve only one part. And what about the rest? Because, of course, the, the, the agreement will be a very complex um, uh, uh, structure of, uh, 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 of uh, mutual concessions and gains. And they not, a single piece cannot be taken out and de dealt with in isolation. Having said this, you know, let me now take my hat refugee worker, you know, all refugees have a right to return to their country. This is enshrined in international law. Uh, now, how this right is eventually exercised is not for an organization like UNRWA to say. We don't have that mandate. This is for the party to the conflict to determine how that right of return will be recognized and implemented. And uh, that's a very, very complicated issue. But up to that point, I do not think that the refugees will be officially integrated in the countries in which they find themselves. And there will be no agreement to discontinue the work of UNRWA, which on behalf of the international community continues to support these populations until that solution is found. I think you're saying that the refugees are an important bargaining chip in the negotiations uh, between Israel and the other countries. Does that mean that it's in the interests of the Palestinians uh, who are refugees not to be integrated, not to become citizens, but to, be, to remain as a bargaining chip? I don't know if it is a bargaining chip. I think that uh, it is a reality of the conflict that these issues have to be resolved altogether. I don't know if you would call Jerusalem a bargaining chip or uh, so if, if they're a bargaining chip, everything, everything else in this conflict is a bargaining chip. I think that uh, I think that the refugees um, have a very strong claim to justice, to recognition of the wrong that was perpetrated against them when they had to leave their homes. This is common to many other refugee populations that I have seen in my career. And uh, I think also that there is an important other elements that I haven't mentioned, but you give me the opportunity of mentioning it. Um, wherever refugee, the Palestinians have been able to live uh, in relative stability, in Jordan, for example, which we haven't really mentioned, but also in Syria up to the beginning of the war, they actually embraced any opportunity they had to have better lives, including the opportunities, frankly, and proudly that we offer them through education, vocational training, better health, and so forth. So there is no, um, often I am told, oh, you know, UNRWA keeps these people in a state of underdevelopment. Quite the opposite. It is the unresolved situation and the repeated conflicts that push them back all the time towards difficult uh, predicaments. But actually, what we do is try to counter that by giving them education, health, and so forth. So uh, you know, in this very complex situation of suspense, in a way, I think that the role that 
my organization plays. And let me tell you, that's why I've stayed so long in this organization, because I think this is a really important role, is to stabilize them to the extent possible by offering them services that otherwise they wouldn't have. Can you give us some idea of the way in which they live? You've referred to the 12 camps in Syria, for example, and I think none of us have a real idea of what a camp is like. Uh, is it a tented camp? Are people living in houses? Does everyone live in a camp, or those that have jobs, do they live elsewhere? Are they, uh, are, do people necessarily have to be cordoned off? No, they don't. Um, uh, remember, here, the length of the question has m means that you should not imagine these camps, so-called camps, like you would imagine the camps in uh, refugees from Somalia or even those from Syria that live under tents and so forth. They lived like this when they first fled in 1948, for sure, for a number of years. But with the passage of time, most of these areas have become villages or suburbs of expanding cities that were much smaller 65 years ago. Uh, in fact, in no country, not even in Lebanon, where probably the refugees live the, under the worst conditions, in no country they're obliged to stay in these camps. They can go out if they can afford it. They, and well over two-thirds of the Palestinian refugees today live outside these camps. They live sometimes nearby. They live in cities. They live in other communities. Generally, those that have been left behind in the camps, the, the 25, 30 percent, are the poorest. And these are the ones that receive most of our services. And because in the camps, life is cheaper, but also it is more difficult in many ways. Um, the camps are like very crowded neighborhoods, let's put it that way. And they vary, you know, in places like Syria before the war, now the camps are destroyed there, but before the war, or in, in, in Jordan, uh, there is not a huge difference between the outskirts of Amman or Damascus and the camps themselves. In places like Lebanon, you can see a huge difference because the Palestinians in Lebanon have not been given access to jobs and to uh, services. That's because of the history of Lebanon and their own role in that history. There, the situation is much more difficult and they're much more dependent on very scarce resources that we can offer them. So you can see very clearly the difference between the areas inhabited by Palestinians and those inhabited by Lebanese. Are there any countries that have offered citizenship uh, or a path to citizenship? Jordan um, is the country that the only country that has made a move in that direction. That Jordan is the country that hosts the largest number of Palestinian refugees, about two million. And King Hussein, so the previous king, in the 80s, uh, as part of a series of political moves, gave a form of citizenship. Now, this is sometimes wrongly interpreted as full citizenship. It is not. It is a form of citizenship which is renewable and uh, gives the Palestinian a number of rights, including that of voting, for example. But, uh, but like I said, it is not full. And Jordan did it uh, with the proviso that this uh, form of citizenship uh, should not pre bring prejudice to their rights of refu as refugees. For example, the right of compensation when eventually there will be a peace agreement. So it's, it's a very qualified type of, of uh, citizenship. The place where probably the Palestinians had the broadest range of rights, although not that of citizenship, was Syria before. But like I said, that unfortunately has gone now back many steps, many tragic steps. And from your experience in other refugee crises, is this an unusual situation where refugees are not given the opportunity to be integrated uh, more fully or not? Um, it is not unique, let's put it that way. You know, I have a lot of experience with Afghans, as you said earlier. I work with Afghan refugees for many years. Look, Afghan refugees have been in Pakistan since 1979. Now, that, that's 30 years less than the Palestinians, but that's a pretty long period of time. 
And in Pakistan, the Afghan refugees have a lot of access to jobs, to, but they're, they're still refugees. They haven't got the full rights of citizens. So, and that also because fundamentally, the fact that they're still there and recognized by the international community as refugees is linked to the fact that the, the violence or the conflicts that originated there their initial flight have not been completely addressed. So there are similarities, although every situation is different. We have situations in Central Africa, in the Horn of Africa, where also there are very protracted situation of refugees. The, 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 the singularity of the Palestinian situation is, is extreme length, of course, because none of these other situation goes back to 1949. And are the numbers unusual, uh, not the 750,000, but the 5 million today? Uh, well, the Afghans reached 6 million or 7 at their peak. Um, they are less now. You know, I was actually responsible for bringing quite a lot back to Afghanistan in, 19, in 2001 and two, but still I think that they number about 3 million. Uh, and you know, unfortunately, these millions of refugees are not too unusual. The Syrians are already way over two million, the Syrians that have fled Syria. And escalating every day, thousands are added to these two million. They're far from the five million. But if you compare with the 750,000 original ones, that's a pretty large outflow. Uh, so unfortunately, these very large conflicts do tend to produce very large outflows, yes. Are there Palestinian refugees who have been resettled in third countries? Very few. Most of the Palestinians have not really wanted to leave the Middle East. And if they have, especially in Lebanon, where, like I said, conditions were very bad, they uh, normally got resettled uh, through family reunification because they had relatives in the United States, in Canada, in Australia, in Europe, in other Western countries. Or, or, or in the Gulf, where there is a very large Palestinian community. So they went on their own, and they rebuilt their lives there, uh, those who could afford it. Again, these tended to be not among the poorest, but among the more affluent uh, uh, strata of, of Palestinian society. But in general, most of them have remained in the region. And uh, actually, that's an interesting uh, point. Uh, a few days ago, you must have followed even from here, it's far away, but I'm sure you followed from the country where I come from, Italy, this was a very big issue. Um, some Palestinians from Syria were found on the boats that cross from northern Africa into the southern shores of Europe, Malta, Italy, Spain. Some actually lost their lives in some of those boats that sank off the coasts of, of Malta and, 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 and northern Africa. Uh, now, this is new. We, we, we have not seen this in any large numbers ever. But that's a symptom, really, of the violence of the situation in Syria and also of the fact that, you know, when I was in Damascus last time, the older Palestinians told me, look, this is for us is a repeat of 1948. It's the second time that we have to flee and escape. But in 1948, which was terrible for us, we went to other countries and we were received with a lot of solidarity. And now we don't see this solidarity anymore. You know, our problem has worn out even our Arab brothers and we don't see that solidarity. And that's why probably we start seeing people trying to fly, flee further abroad. I was in places like Malaysia recently, and I was told by the government that some had already reached there. Just to give you a sense of how this crisis has this, how do you say it in English, centrifugal power of, 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 of scattering people, not just Palestinians, but Syrians as well, across the whole world. When you, gave, when you told us this story uh, about someone talking about 1948, they really were referring historically to what happened to the people. Because I gather there's something like 6% of the actual refugees from 1948 who are still living. Is that some? Oh, that? Yeah, of course, because people that were uh, adult or older in 1948 are either very old or are not, are not there anymore. So. Uh, but, you know, this is another issue that is often raised. Why, why do you assist also those that are the children and grandchildren? Well, you know, frankly, this is really not unique. <laughs> uh, 
other organizations assisting, I go back to the example I know well because it's so big, uh, refugees in Afghanistan, they are already at the third generation and they are considered refugees because the overall refugee question has not been resolved. Uh, so it's not unique to this particular situation. When you discussed Jordan and how it had created a favorable treatment in terms of citizenship, a one of the people in the audience asks, why has Jordan closed the border now to Palestinian refugees who are fleeing Syria? I think it is an indication of um, the sense of fragility of uh, a country that has been relatively stable but is um, in the middle of so many difficult crises. Remember the geographic geographical position of Jordan. On the west side, it has Israel and the Palestinian territory. On the north, it has Syria. On the east, it has Iraq. And on the south, it has Egypt and Saudi Arabia. Uh, for a small country with few resources and a complex internal set of balances, including the crucial balance between Palestinians and not Palestinians, this is not a very happy geographical position to be in. So I, the argument that the Jordanians have manifested or have put forward is that they already host more than 2 million Palestinian refugees plus other Palestinians that are not refugees, as a matter of fact. And uh, they host Iraqi refugees from previous influxes and now maybe 600,000 Syrian refugees, they, did, they felt that their share of the burden was already uh, complete and they couldn't take any more, especially Palestinians, which would increase their Palestinian population even further. We have actually disagreed with, well, understood, appreciated this position. You know, it's not easy to have to receive hundreds of thousands of refugees no Western country is taking hundreds of thousands of refugees out of this or other crisis. So, you know, it's easy to criticize but you're, when you're not a neighboring country. But we've also said that, you know, from the point of view of humanitarian principles and international refugee law, it was important to take in Palestinians just like uh, Syrians. They were fleeing exactly the same problems. But it has been uh, quite complicated. So, but we are discussing with the Jordanian. You know, we have a very close partnership with the government of Jordan over the years. They've been perhaps of the host country, the one closest to us. So it's not a very easy discussion, but it is a discussion that goes on. And in a few cases, they have taken a few people in. Are there refugees in Egypt? You really haven't uh, addressed that. And how the instability in Egypt may be affecting refugees not only in Egypt, but elsewhere? There are um, many Syrians that have gone to Egypt by air from Damascus or by other means. And among these Syrians that I think are in excess of 100,000, there are a few Palestinians from Syria, maybe five, 6,000. Uh, it has been difficult for everybody because Egypt has a rather complex uh, approach to refugees coming to the country traditionally, but now this has been, has overlapped with a very complex situation of Egypt of the past two and a half years since the revolution that ousted President Mubarak. As you know, they went through uh, a complex transition, elections, the Morsi presidency, the overthrow of Morsi, and now a, a new uh, regime that seems to have reverted back to some of the Mubarak approaches, although of course it cannot ignore all the history that has happened in the past two and a half years. The Palestinians once again have been um, somehow caught into this. Um, uh, not only those few thousand coming from Syria, but also those in Gaza that are neighboring Egypt, because uh, the, the new government in Egypt, the current one, sees Hamas that rules Gaza as a close ally of the Morsi government that they have overthrown. So there's a lot of tensions between Gaza and Egypt at the moment. They have closed all these illegal tunnels. Illegal, yes, but they provided some relief to the Gaza Strip. Um, and the, the, this has added 
to the various pressures on the Palestinians. Again, largely because of a situation that is not their own, but is affecting a country that is so important for their survival. In general, uh, how has UNRWA been, been affected by the growth of fundamentalism? Well, um, has it made UNRWA's job more difficult? Uh, has it uh, radicalized the people you are serving? Let's put it that way. It has meant that w among our interlocutors has been an increasing number of people that are, as you say, fundamentalists. You know, fundamentalism is is a complex phenomenon, has many shades and many aspects, and I hesitate to to divide the 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 the, the, the Arab world in or the. Muslim world in fundamentalist and, and secular. There's, there's many shades just like there are in other cultures and in other regions. Uh, but certainly, uh, you know, uh, we have had to deal with cultural trends or interlocutors, political interlocutors, that um, embrace a, a brand of more radical politics, Islamic politics, uh, including Hamas, for ex or in particular including Hamas, but, but not only. And uh, we are saved in a way in all this situation by the mandate that we have. We are the only United Nations organization, I didn't say that, that provide direct services to the people. We don't work through anybody. We don't work through NGOs. We don't work through governments. We provide service. That's why we're so big in numbers. You know. I had an organization of 30,000 people. Most of them are teachers, doctors, nurses, social workers, uh, microfinance operators. They are mostly Palestinians themselves, 99.8%. There's very few expatriates. So that direct link, which comes from our mandate to serve this population directly, has somehow insulated us to an extent from undue influences of any type especially political influence, not completely, but to an extent. But certainly, for example, to continue to carry out secular education, like we do in our schools, has not always been very easy. We've been subjected to some criticism, but we've always been able to negotiate and find solutions to push this forward because of the autonomy that we enjoy and that is actually upheld by all these countries for a variety of reasons. A recent New York Times article indicated that there have been significant changes in the textbooks in Gaza. The new textbooks don't recognize modern Israel, do not mention the Oslo Peace Accord, show maps of Palestine, which define Haifa, Beersheba, and Acre as part of the, uh, not part of Israel, but part of Palestine. Um, how does that affect, that's obviously being taught in Gaza, uh, and the question is, uh, you have something like uh, 250 schools in Gaza. How does this affect uh, the students who are at your schools? I think you're referring to this morning's article on the front page of the New York Times on this issue. Um, but it's, it's the same answer I gave earlier. We don't have to follow those changes. We, uh, in fact, what we do, uh, to just explain clearly, in our schools we have the curriculum of the host authorities. So in the Palestine territories, we have the curriculum of the Palestinian Authority. As a matter of fact, Hamas also has used that curriculum in their school because these are all schools of the Palestinian Authority. Hamas is the current political party that controls the Gaza Strip. This is the first time, to my knowledge, in seven, six, seven years, that Hamas actually introduces substantive changes in the Palestinian Authority curriculum, those that you have just mentioned. But I want to make it very clear. We don't have to follow that. We continue to teach the Palestinian Authority curriculum, which is a curriculum that has undergone a lot of scrutiny, including by U.S. experts, obviously because the Palestinian Authority, just like UNRWA, receives funding from the United States. So Congress has always been very vigilant in scrutinizing and making sure that the curriculum taught in PA schools 
is, is suitable. It does follow, of course, the Palestinian narrative. I mean, which other people uh, teaches its children other than through its narrative? But the, the insightful elements have always, we've always tried ourselves to, we've contributed a lot to weed them out. We actually, this gives me opportunity to mention something interesting. Actually, since the year 2000, we at UNRWA have introduced, have got permission from everybody, including the countries in the region, to introduce an additional element of curriculum to our teaching. It's called Human Rights Conflict Resolution and Tolerance Curriculum. This is unique in the region. And that has, a, you know, that has sometimes been a bit contentious, but we've been able to actually not only teach it, but improve it now over the course of 13 years. That's an example. You know, when I said, yes, we serve a population that is in suspense, is in limbo somehow, but we give them opportunities to the extent possible. One of them is to teach them important values and approaches that, frankly, will be difficult for them to find in their communities, in the, certainly in, in, in government schools and so forth. So this is one of the advantages of this very peculiar situation we're in. Do you find any change in attitude among the refugees in general as the UN has uh, started the recognition process, to, uh, process of Palestine? Not really, because remember, um, the state of Palestine is, is a political process that was promoted and led by the Palestinian leadership in Ramallah, it doesn't really concern the refugees directly. Technically, remember, the refugees don't come from what is likely to become the state of Palestine. They come from what is now the state of Israel. That's the big difficulty here. So they don't feel directly concerned by the evolution of a state. Uh, we will have to see when peace comes how this all hands out and gels together. But that's a, a, a process that does not concern them directly. They followed it with interest. I think they've, by and large, supported it. I think the attitude of most Palestinians towards that, what was essentially a legal process in the General Assembly, has been positive. Yes, good that we are recognized as a state, but in, as a matter of fact, on the ground, that state cannot exist under occupation. So there is a very realistic appreciation of the situation, including among the refugees. Is there a quota in the U.S. for Palestinian refugees? And what can the United States and its people do to reduce the plight of the Palestinian refugees? You mean a quota of resettlement? Yes. No, I think that there's been some Palestinians resettled. Uh, UNRWA doesn't do resettlement. This is not part of our responsibilities. We delegate this to the larger refugee agency, to UNHCR, because most of the most of the very few Palestinians that are resettled are actually outside our area of operation. So UNHCR takes care of that. But it's very small numbers, like I said earlier. I think what the United States sh must do is what it is already doing. On the one hand, and we really applaud this, um, strongly um, encourage the parties to make peace and to include the refugee question to that peace, because that's the fundamental issue in the end, if we want to close it and move on. And then meanwhile, because that may take some time, it would be so complicated, continue to support the refugees through UNRWA. And again, that is something that in spite of, you know, difficult discussions on our work that happen in Congress and uh, in, uh, in other uh, segments of American society, uh, uh, U.S. support has been very strong in recognition of the important role that we play. And I wish, I hope, I trust that this will continue until we are necessary. Your audience today could not be just impressed with the information, but also with your passion. And so a question is, what has made you so passionate about the refugee program? Uh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, uh, I started working with refugees in 1984. I, uh, I was then a volunteer with an American organization in Thailand with the uh, Catholic Relief Services. And uh, 
I had a very uh, I had very simple tasks as a very young and inexperienced volunteer, which was really to work with in some of the refugee camps, Cambodian refugee camps in Thailand. They, they, was, they were still fighting in Indochina then. We go back a long time. And so my task was to organize relief and other activities on a relatively small scale. But there are two things that I was telling you earlier that struck me from the very beginning. That unlike perhaps, perhaps other humanitarian situation, or maybe not so much unlike, but more peculiarly, refugee situations were a mix of political complexity, conflict usually, which I found interesting from day one because I thought that they were a very important symptom or a very important aspect of the world I was living in. And on the other hand, they generated suffering that was really heartbreaking because these were people and that's the definition of a refugee that had lost the fundamental protection that every citizen is entitled to which is the protection of your state so the combination of compassion for the suffering but also interest for the context made me think that this was a worthwhile issue to follow and so i did Thank you, and with that, our program is concluded. So on behalf of the World Affairs Council, I ask you all to join me in thanking Filippo Grandi for this outstanding presentation and discussion. Thanks to you all as well. <laughs>